it's perhaps nowhere clearer than in a Chinese tea house that tea is more than just a drink. Indeed, it's more than a refreshing distillation of nature's most appealing fragrances. The tea house is also a lifeblood of a community at ease with itself, seasoned with the comings and goings of generations of tea drinkers. And for those whose labours revolve around producing tea, or picking flowers to scent tea, life is dictated by the seasons. Their lives led by Earth's revolution around the sun and the varying warmth it radiates. Tea is a waiting game, waiting for the optimum moment, but not missing it. Waiting for the rain, for sunlight, warmth and wind to work their magic. The same applies to artists who capture the spirit of tea in photography. They can wait an eternity for the right light to bring their image to fruition. With this in mind, we will visit Urmei Mountain in Sichuan province, where thyme is a most highly valued ingredient in its production of tea. There's more to come though, for the serving of tea has a moral quality too, especially in the courtesies and principles of the tea ceremony, which will bring us to one woman's ambition to perform the ceremony where she feels it belongs, in the midst of nature and among the very elements that nurture the tea leaf itself. Every morning at five o'clock, 70-year-old Auntie Zhao wakes up to get the tea house ready. These are all old houses. They haven't changed for 300 years. This used to be a temple. There used to be Buddhist statues on top. When I was young, I lived across the street. This was always a tea house, even before the communists took over. Auntie Zhao's tea house doesn't have a signboard. But because this used to be a temple for the Goddess of Mercy, everybody calls it the Goddess of Mercy Tea House. One cup of tea costs one yuan. The refills are free. One can hang out here all day. Auntie Zhao has been running this tea house for a long time. The work is tough and she doesn't make much money. Her children have been telling her to shut the place down, but she can't bear to let her customers down. So she still keeps the tea house running every day. Tea houses used to be the most important social venue in China. But now, tea houses like this have become very rare. The building of the Goddess of Mercy Tea House contains many memories. It has been the place of leisure for the people of Pengzhen for over a hundred years. These are footprints. These are all the footprints of people who've been here. When it's packed, it gets really crowded. It's always been like that. They've dug it up before and then they step all over it again. People from other places say it's very relaxing here. When they leave, they tell me that I mustn't let the floor get dug up again. No matter how hectic the lives of her regular customers are, as long as they have their tea, they will be relaxed. Chinese people think that life is just like tea. The bitter always becomes before the sweet. Hey! Everybody come down and start picking flowers! It is late summer in Fuzhou. Wei Xuemei and her sister are picking jasmine flowers under the hot sun. They come from the Sandu Shui Autonomous County in Guizhou. 
Here, Wei Shui Mei picks about 20 kilograms of jasmine each day. She makes 200 yuan from this. Take it down and weigh it. 12.5 kilograms. Nani, 12.5 kilograms. The flowers that Wei Shui Mei picked will be made into a famous aromatic tea. The flowers are very springy. In the evening, Master Chen Cheng Zong has just received the jasmine flowers that were picked today. The first step in making jasmine tea is to process the tea leaves. We step on the leaves to extract the tea and keep the stalks. Chen Cheng Zhang is 63 years old this year. He grew up in a government tea factory. He stays up till late every night during the summer because jasmine only blooms at night. The second step is to process the flower buds. The temperature of the flower buds are rising inside. Chen Chengzong calls this the breathing of the flowers. Experienced tea producers only need to put their hands inside the flower heap to know when the flowers need to be stirred again. When the petals begin to open, that is when the jasmine starts to give out its delicate fragrance. Use the second sieve. You need to sift it hard to get rid of the bad ones. You need to make a circular motion with your arms. The third step is the scenting. This is the most important step. The dry tea leaves have to absorb the fragrance of the fresh jasmine. It is necessary to have the right proportion of tea and jasmine and to control the time they are placed together. During the scenting process, the flowers need to be stirred constantly. It has to be monitored through the night and on to the next day. Last night, Wei Shui Mei and her sister came to a decision. Today will be their last day picking flowers. The corn in their hometown has ripened and needs to be harvested. At the end of August, most people who work away from home will return. This is one of the few opportunities in the year for families to get together. Wei Shui Mei doesn't really want to go home. There is still another month left for the flower picking season. If she stayed, she could make 6,000 more yuan. The corn that she's going to harvest now is for pig feed. They won't make any money from it at all. When you tend to your own fields, you'll have enough to eat, but you won't make any money. Having a pig is the same thing. My oldest daughter is in high school now. She needs a lot of money every semester, about 10,000 yuan. If I stay at home, I won't have the money to send her to school. That's why I have to work away from home. You're getting paid! Come on, everyone come down! 995 yuan? Why don't you just give me one more yuan? You're the boss. 
Why are you so stingy over 50 cents? I'll give you a ticket later. I'll give all of you tickets. What? You're giving me a ticket? Thank you so much, then. I hope to see you again next year. All right? Come back next year. Thanks for your hard work. If you have flowers to pick again next year, just give me a call. In Fuzhou City, Chen Cheng Zhang's tea is nearing completion. The tea leaves have absorbed the water and fragrance from the flowers. The fresh jasmine is now wilted. Chen Cheng Zhang uses a fine sieve to separate the tea leaves from the flowers. He prepared the charcoal fire last night. The last thing he has to do now is to dry the leaves. This is another scenting process. Good jasmine tea is scented at least nine times. Nine times of scenting. In the traditional way of doing it, every scenting requires three days. It's not easy to make a good cup of flower tea. As far as he can remember, Chen Cheng Zong has never slept at night during the summer. But everywhere he goes, he gives off a fresh, sweet-smelling jasmine scent. In Wei Shuimei's hometown, farmland is scarce. Her corn is grown on the side of the mountain. My field is dry and doesn't produce much. Flower picking is much better. They provide meals for you, and you just pick the flowers. It's much harder at home. In the first half of the year, I'm here planting corn. In the second half of the year, I'm in Guangdong harvesting sugarcane. The farmers of China give their physical strength for the harvests. Just like migratory birds, they move to different lands when the seasons change. I have no idea what they're used for. I don't know where they're processed either. Wei Shui Mei has made a souvenir for herself out of these jasmine flowers, but she has never tasted the tea made from these flowers. The tea planters, the tea pickers, the tea producers, the tea drinkers. All their fates are connected through this cup of tea. True tea people know that the aroma of the tea doesn't come from the teacup, but from the heart. The American photographer, Matthew, began searching for the tea spirit in his photography in 2007. You know, tea is ubiquitous in China. Tea is everywhere, and tea is quite ordinary. So I would use my heart to find people that, for me, represented this tea spirit. So it's been very clear to me what my goal is, and I just move forward bit by bit. It's just the colors of the shot are just stunning. You know, I actually planned this shot for two years uh, before I took it. 
and I carried it around with me in my mind and sort of built the shot. And it was actually not until my very last trip uh, to China and Hong Kong, uh, that it was actually the last day of the last trip. Through his photography, Matthew has met many tea people from all over China. They welcome him into their homes, opening up their doors to him and showing him the various aspects of their lives. The journey of, of tea, of drinking tea, of working on this project about the spirit of tea has, has actually transformed my life in many ways. One of the incredible things, one of the incredible gifts of this project is that I met my wife. In 2008, when Matthew was working in Shanghai, he couldn't speak Mandarin very well. He needed a translator. A Chinese woman, Wen Xiao Rei, became his assistant, and later, she became his wife. To Matthew, the tea spirit embodies human civilization. It is his hope to show this beautiful culture to the world. Something really important for us as humans is to, to listen deeply to our passion and to follow our passion. I've placed tea higher than money. The tea has its own consciousness. The tea is using the humans to spread its message to the world. And I'm very happy to allow myself to be used by the tea to, to spread this message of the spirit of tea. This old man is the oldest person Matthew has ever photographed. In Chinese tradition, there is the concept of tea longevity. The numerology of the word tea is 108. Jiang Tianfu was born in 1910. He is 104 years old this year. Tea longevity is the best gift for the elderly. Jiang Tianfu's day begins with 10 cups of good tea. Today, a few of his tea friends have come to visit him. Jiang shares with them 10 different types of tea from all over the world. When I was in middle school, I had a few friends. China was an agricultural country at the time. We all wanted to go into agriculture after we graduated to do something for our country. The tea from Fujian province is the most famous around the world. That was what I wanted to do. The Japanese made fun of us for massaging the tea by stepping on it. We didn't have any machines or electricity in the villages at the time, so I wanted to invent a machine to make tea. After graduating college, Jiang Tianfu invented the first wooden tea massaging machine in China. This put an end to the practice of massaging tea by foot. He also set up the first tea research society and the first tea academy in Fujian province. Today, the tea that Jiang Tianfu is anticipating the most still hasn't arrived. Meanwhile, 100 kilometers away in Anxi, workers are rushing to produce this new tea. This is where the famous Tia Guanyin comes from. Most famous teas in China are only made in the spring, but Tia Guanyin has several versions. The spring version, summer version, and autumn version. They all taste different. Because it is grown year round, it has a bigger pest problem. Safety standards are highly scrutinized today. Tea producers have to be more careful about the amount of pesticide that they use. They want to make a tea that is as clean as possible. The first batch of tea is on its way, even before it is packaged. Give me the tea leaves. <laughs> Close to sunset, the tea finally arrives. This is the first batch of tea leaves this year. 
Is there just one type? So it's only picked once? Yes, just once. How many kilograms do you pick each time? 100 kilograms. Do you run tests on it in Xiamen? Yes, they'll test it. The tea that has arrived today is special in that it has been completely organically farmed. It is grown in the first organic tea estate under Jiang Tianfu's supervision. It's not red enough. Okay. Three years ago, concerned about the safety of tea leaves, Jiang Tianfu went to Fujian with his students and supervised the cultivation of an organic tea estate. We shouldn't be using pesticides at all when we grow tea. This organic tea estate is built on soil that has no heavy metal pollution. Chemical fertilizers and pesticides are banned here. It uses natural predators to keep the pests away. Advanced technology is then used to test the compounds in the tea leaves. This is so as to make a clean tea. Jujian village in northern Fujian is surrounded by mountains. The shepherds herd their goats to the mountains to graze, rain or shine. Jujian village's natural pastures provide food for its goats, which attract merchants from everywhere in Fujian. Fang Shoulong is driving from Fuding 400 kilometers away. Unlike other merchants, he's not here for the goats. Goat manure is the best traditional fertilizer. It has a lot of minerals and really fertilizes the soil. Once the goats are herded up to the mountains, the shepherds here collect the goat feces from the night before. This provides them with an extra source of income. Fang Shoulong is here to buy these goat feces. Once the goat feces are dried, they are transported 400 kilometers back to Fuding. Fang Shoulong's tea plantation is only 11 acres in size. It is located in the mountains of the She people. The She people live in the southeastern coast of China. They are an ancient tea cultivating people. This tea plantation doesn't use chemical fertilizers at all. It uses natural predators to keep the pests under control. Goat manure is used to fertilize the soil. Fang Shoulong wants to use the most natural, non-toxic methods to care for his tea plantation. Fang Shoulong manufactures organic white tea. His yield is only a third of the regular white tea. We're working towards an ideal, and that is to grow our tea leaves in the most natural environment. We are tea producers, and we hope to gain recognition for that. Make it as wide as everything else. Look here. 
Make sure you spread it evenly. Spread it evenly. Spread it in the cracks and then cover it with dirt. Just like that. Fang Shulong's way of life is a continuation of the thousand-year-old tea growing tradition in China. Good people make good tea. This has always been a maxim in China. Auntie Chen is a tea farmer in Sichuan's Mount Ermei. During the springtime, she collects leaves from the Chinese wingnut tree in front of her house to make a special herbal mixture. My grandfather and my father were doing this too. They say this is not harmful to people. We pound it and mix it with water. Then we put it in the sprinkler and spray it. Auntie Chen's tea estate doesn't use chemical fertilizers. She uses this traditional herbal mixture to get rid of pests. If you spray this, you can kill all the pests. This isn't toxic for human beings. We can safely eat it. This is Mount Ome's best tea estate. It is hidden deep in the virgin forests, 800 to 1200 meters above sea level. Mount Ome is a famous mountain for the Buddhists. Tea has been cultivated there since antiquity. The most famous green tea for Mount Ome, Juyu Qing tea, was created by the monks living there. The first buds of spring are the best part of the tea plant. Auntie Chen takes four days to pick 80,000 tea buds, enough to make only half a kilogram of Juye Qing tea. But Auntie Chen isn't afraid of hard work. She's most afraid of the thieves here. Legend goes that the monkeys on Mount Erme can pick tea themselves. Actually, they're only interested in stealing the tea leaves. Once the buds are separated from the plant, they wither and die. But the skillful hands of the tea master gives them new life. I've been doing this since I was a kid. I'm 91 years old now. I've been making Zhu Ye Qing tea for 82 years. Li Zongming is one of the best tea producers in Mount Erme. Most of the tea masters making Zhu Ye Qing tea these days used to be his disciples. But he still finds time to make some of his own tea in this old pan. You mustn't let the tea leave your hand. And your hand must never touch the pan. If you touch the pan, you'll get burnt. The firing part is important, but so is the tidying of the leaves and the final drying process. They are all important. If you mess up any one part, you can't make good tea. After being processed by a tea master, the tea leaves look, smell, and taste excellent. But for it to truly become a treasure, there is still one more requirement. We only keep the tea leaves that are complete. They can't be too big, they can't be too small, and the color has to be even. They can't have any flaws. They should be shaped like the bamboo leaves that pandas eat. We keep only 300 grams of tea leaves out of 1,500. 
When I look at the tea leaves that I've sorted out, I think they look like beautiful women. They look so beautiful. As we enter the 21st century, the traditional tea industry in China has been completely modernized. Advanced molecular food technology is now being used to pioneer the modern processing of tea leaves. But whether it is the most advanced technology or the most traditional hand processing methods, all that counts is a cup of good tea. A tea leaf goes through so many ordeals in its life. It dies and it is brought back to life again. The powerful call of water helps it to reach its spiritual zenith. And this extraordinary journey reaches its end when the tea drinker raises the cup to his mouth. That is why tea is seen as the beverage for the soul. The beginning of April is the season for picking. It is also the time when the different schools of the Japanese tea ceremony hold their annual tea gatherings. Eighty-three-year-old Tange Megetsu is the founder of a Japanese tea school called the Tange School. Today, she is getting ready for her school's tea gathering. Come here! You're so cute. In ancient Japan, the tea ceremony was an exclusively male realm. Other than a few people in the aristocracy, very few women had the privilege to learn the tea ceremony. But as society progressed, this social taboo no longer exists. After the Second World War, the status of women in Japanese society has slowly risen. The tea ceremony can heal the trauma of war. Because of the elegance of the tea ceremony, women slowly became one of the main practitioners of the tea ceremony. Tange Megetsu was born into a wealthy family in Kamakura. She grew up practicing the tea ceremony. It has always been part of her life. This is a picture of me when I was about a year old. Everyone thought I was so cute. They really pampered me. <laughs> this is a picture of me when I was young. Tange Megetsu spent her teenage years in the northeast of China. Her father was a high-ranking military official in the Imperial Japanese Army. When Japan invaded northeastern China, Tange Megetsu moved there with her family. I remember that we had different schools for Chinese and Japanese people at the time. So it's very sad because I didn't have any Chinese friends at all. There were more sad times and happy times then. That's just how it was. After the war, Tange Megetsu moved back to Japan and started learning the tea ceremony. The Japanese invasion of China was a truly terrible thing. My father was later persecuted and he was sentenced to death. Tange Megetsu comes to China every autumn. She teaches the tea ceremony at a university in Hangzhou. This has been going on for 20 years. 
Good morning, teacher. Good morning, everyone. Our teacher is dressed in a Japanese kimono today. She first started learning the tea ceremony because she wanted to wear kimonos. She thought they were very beautiful and elegant. That's how she started getting interested in tea culture. We'll use various tea equipment today. These classes are free. When her Chinese students go to Japan to study, they would usually stay at Tange Megetsu's house. A few years ago, Tange Megetsu sold a property in Japan and donated it to the China National Tea Museum in Hangzhou. I learned four concepts from the Chinese classic, the Book of Rights, courtesy, peace, respect, and happiness. Only with courtesy will you have peace. Only with respect for others will you have happiness. My practice of the tea ceremony is grounded in these four concepts. I've forgotten most of my painful past. I feel really happy now. I can do what I love, the tea ceremony. I wrote an essay once, called Two Countries. I think of both China and Japan as my homeland. The tea ceremony is practiced differently in China than it is in Japan. 2013, Beijing's National Center for the Performing Arts. A tea show accompanied by Gu Qin is in progress. The organizer of this ceremony is Taiwanese tea master Li Shu Yun. Li Shu Yun never stops moving. 20 years ago, she left her country of origin, Singapore, and went to Taiwan to study tea. She later set up Non-Solo Tea, an organization that holds a series of theatrical tea shows, the very first multidisciplinary tea culture organization in the world. In Li Shuyun's mind, the tea show is the place where dreams are created. I want to create what cannot exist in daily life on the stage with the help of some props and people. I want to retain a kind of consciousness that is closer to what we strive for. In 2013, Li Shuyun comes to the mainland to develop further. Before I turned 40, I was insistent on beauty. That was all I wanted. But when I came to Beijing, my ideas started to change. Li Shuyun is organizing her very first tea show in the highlands. Every tea show is like a meditation retreat for both the tea masters and the guests. By taking the tea show out of the tea house and into the vastness of the highlands, Li Shuyun hopes to create a different experience for the people one that will bring them new horizons. But summers in Shangri-La can have unpredictable weather. This is the biggest concern for the show. This outdoor stage is just so magnetic. This tea will shatter so many boundaries. Li Shuyun has ordered specially made costumes and instruments for this show. Her students brought the tea equipment from Taiwan. 
They've been preparing this show for three months now. A sudden thunderstorm interrupts the preparations for the show. Li Shuyun is worried that her efforts that have gone into this show will go to waste. Right before the show is about to go on, the sky clears up. It's different making tea in an enclosed room and making tea in such a vast, open landscape. We're sharing this tea with the earth here. The inspiration we'll get from this is usually so much more than the energy we give. We would like to give you something through the tea equipment and the placement of all the objects. We hope that you'll take back a warm memory with you. Thank you. After a show like this, you'll realize that you have a lot more energy. The Shangri-La Tea Show was accompanied by wind and rain. The weather can change quickly. It can go from being a sunny summer day to a cold windy day in just 15 minutes. The entire arrangement was messed up several times. Of course I was worried, but that doesn't matter at all actually. It's about accepting it and letting go. After such an incredible experience, this tea became so much more meaningful to us. It engenders so much more respect in us as human beings. It doesn't matter if people don't understand us. Tea masters must bring out the most honest, perfect side in them. Li Shuyun's tea house is located on Guozi Jian Street in Beijing. In this tiny room, she hopes to keep practicing tea ceremony to create new paths and take it to the next level. Tea masters are special. Once you become a tea master, every time you scoop a ladle of water or boil it, you'll never forget the philosophy behind it all. I think the tea ceremony is just like life. It manifests itself everywhere, in every aspect of our lives. The story of tea spans continents, cultures and centuries. From its earliest tribal beginnings in remote pockets of China, to today's blends sipped from porcelain cups in five-star hotels, or vended from such celebrated tea emporiums as Fortnum & Mason here on Piccadilly in St. James's, London. Tea has nurtured an enduring fascination for its flavors and its effects. The story of tea is one of discovery, determination, and diligence, of cultural cross-pollination, of empire and export, and of the aspirations that the leaf inspires in its devotees. In the art of the Japanese tea ceremony, the preparation of tea reaches a spiritual zenith in its mesmerizing rituals. In the garrulous setting of a Chinese tea house, it's a potion that brings people together and lubricates conversation. High up on the Tibet Qinghai Plateau, tea brings both warmth and sustenance while in the heart of an irrepressible English enthusiast, it is something to be nurtured to fruition on English soil. 
T can be simple, it can be complex, and it can be all points in between. To a tea farmer, it is both work and a source of pride, of life and of hope. To a tea drinker, it can be a chance to disengage from life's labors and to reflect. It is a drink, it is a way of life. It is a conversation between man and nature. As a drink, it unites water and the flavors of leaf and flower into an aromatic beverage that slows down time, allowing us to unwind and find harmony in its ceremonies. It is a way of savoring the moment. As a way of life, it is a calling. Whether it's performing a tea ceremony, selecting a blend as a tea master, or picking leaves as a farmer, life revolves around tea. It is a gift that rewards as regularly as the seasons change. Well, you could also say that the bowl of tea is the still point at the heart of our demanding and ever-changing lives. And you'd be right.